Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We are live at the top of the hour. My name is Lynn O'Hara, and I'm the Director of Programs at National History Day. We are, I'm so excited to be joined this evening by Melanie Zeck. Uh, Melanie is a musicologist at the American Folklife Center, and we're gonna be talking about different strategies to integrate music into your classroom and into your students' NHD research using the resources of the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress. But before we begin, before we begin just a few housekeeping items. First off, we want to answer your questions. And I don't want you to be intimidated by this topic. I will be honest, I can't read music. I'm not terribly musical. I have rhythm, I used to dance, but in terms of like understanding or studying music, that's something as a teacher that I struggled with. And Melanie is the kind of expert who's going to help take some of these complicated concepts and make them approachable, not just for you, but also for your students. If you stick with us to the end, we do have a feedback survey. Please use that. It does two things. One, it gives us some feedback on our programming, but also it will email you a confirmation. You'll get a copy of your responses. Teachers, if you're doing professional development with us, please print that out or email it or take it to your principal and add that in to show the time that you're investing in learning more to help your students. Um, and students, if you've got a teacher who's offering you extra credit, filling out that survey with your correct email will get that email sent to you so you have proof to show your teacher or to forward to your teacher. We ha have the video of this program and the slides. They'll be shared with all participants. You got a pre-registration email, so about an hour before this program started, that ha gave you a link to access these slides. If you find it easier to watch or to print these out to use them later, you have access to that. One quick note, we're talking about music tonight, so we're going to use both audio and video clips. When we get to those points, I'm going to encourage you to please turn the volume all the way up on your computer, and if you have a headset with volume control, turn it all the way up. These are historic recordings and we are streaming them through a live stream platform. So the volume is a little low, but if you turn it up, I think you're gonna be able to hear it. All right, well, that's plenty for me. What I wanna do is introduce Melanie Zeck. I had the opportunity to meet Melanie uh, almost a year ago now in a visit to the Library of Congress because at History Day, we've been doing some really cool projects with the library. Keep in mind, put your questions in the question box at any time during the program, and we'll do a Q&A session at the end, and I promise we'll answer as many as we can. All right, now that we're set up, I'm gonna turn things over to Melanie. Melanie, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you, Lynn, and thank you to everyone at National History Day. I think we're gonna have a really nice time tonight. Shall we get started? Let's go. All right. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining me for this musically themed National History Day webinar. This evening, we're going to go through a series of scaffolded exercises that will offer techniques by which you and your young scholars I'm so sorry, it seems that we have lost Melanie's audio. Melanie, I'm not sure if you're frozen, but if you wouldn't mind, if you could close out and come back in. I do have Melanie's script and I can keep going, but this really is her presentation. So I appreciate if you all could just hold on with us a moment while we get this connection reestablished. My apologies for those of you who have just joined us. I promise we start a half an hour early here. We log on, we test our audio, we test our video. And sometimes exactly when we go live is when somebody's audio or video will freeze out. Um, I did speak with Melanie before. She does have a second computer up. So she is gonna be logging back on through that second computer. If you could just pause and be patient with us a moment. I'm so sorry, we never intend for this to happen but sometimes it just does. So if you give us just a moment. While we're waiting, what I'd love for you to do is to fill that question box with any questions that you might have. Uh, these could be about questions about teaching music, 
music in certain categories. We know that some students are working on NHD projects uh, and they might have musical influences. I actually have a couple questions already in about that. And I will make sure that any questions that we don't cover, we will answer. So we'd love to do that. I'll give Melanie just a moment. And in the meantime, if you have any NHD questions, you're welcome to put them in here and I will do my best to answer them. Um, actually, I do have an NHD question in the queue, so why don't I go ahead and answer it. The question is, if you're building a website, so this is for my website students here, if you are building a website for National History Day, do we need copyright permission to include songs as part of your multimedia components of your website? And that's a really good question. When you build your websites through NHD, you use the NHD Web Central Builder. That builder is specific to NHD and it is closed. So that's important because what that means is that it's not Google searchable. If you build a website, the only way that I can get to your website, I can't search it, I can't search your name or your school or your topic, you have to give me that URL, right? That code, that set of numbers ahead is part of the URL. That does a couple things. One is it protects our student privacy. But it also makes sure that these websites are private and not public, that you have to have the direct address. Because of that, what that means kind of on our end is that music that you may use or other copyrighted material that you may use is allowed. And the reason is, is that falls under this idea of ed uh, educational fair use, which means students and teachers are allowed to use copyrighted material provided that they are only using it for educational purposes, which means they can use it in classrooms, they can use it at a National History Day contest. What they can't do is share and promote it publicly or engage in any kind of activities in which they're charging admission. Uh, this tends to apply more to our documentary students than our website students, but the same rules would apply. You would be allowed to use these, however, uh, what you are, do you have to do, it's really, really crucial that you give credit. It's important that we make sure that those who create this, that, that those who create copyrighted material are properly credited. And that's super, super important. Okay, so I've got that question. Let's see if there's any other NHC questions in the queue that I can answer and hopefully we'll get, oh, it looks like we've got Melanie coming back on. <laughs> oh, something okay. happens, right? <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> That's okay. Actually, I've been answering NHD questions in the interim. Oh, super. So, not a problem. So here's what we're going to do. We are still recording, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and okay. let you reset and start again. And what we'll do is we'll fix it in the video. Nobody needs to know. All right. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for your patience. I'm going to turn things back over to Melanie. And in the event this happens again, fear not, we will figure this out. And if it does happen, I encourage you to have a sing-along in my absence. <laughs> so as I was starting out, I really just wanted to introduce myself and say hello. I'm Melanie. And I'm really happy to be here tonight, uh, hopefully permanently on the Zoom call. Um, but, you know, one of the things we're going to be doing tonight is we're going to be doing these exercises, and they are scaffolded. And what's nice about that is we'll be able to do some of them together. For others, we're actually going to take a look at some sample resources and some search strategies that I'm hoping you'll be able to incorporate into the work you do uh, as a National History Day coach and getting that kind of those ideas into the minds of your young scholars. In our seminar tonight, we're going to be focusing on songs, and that is pieces of music that contain words and we'll begin to build sound profiles. Now our profiles will take into account three musical considerations. The first, we'll be considering our personal experiences of music, just as we talked about earlier. Second, we'll be considering important components of music. And third, we'll be considering the historical and cultural meanings assigned to music over time. So as you follow along, feel free to do your own profile on the templates sent out a little while ago, or even on a blank piece of paper. You can even just watch for now on the screen and go back later when you've got more time. But when we create these sound profiles, we're also gonna be learning this evening how to conduct the necessary archival research to contextualize them. 
Now our theme for this evening is unlocking the rhythms, but we will be doing much more than figuring out the beat of a song. For me, unlocking the rhythms is a, it's a metaphor for uncovering musical secrets, which includes learning how a song works, what it means to you, what it means to others, and why. And to do that, we'll be availing ourselves of a variety of resources held at the Library of Congress and its American Folklife Center. To get us started, I'll present a song. I will hum it first, then I'll have the lyrics. And as I do, be thinking of your earliest memories of this song, where you were, from whom you learned it, and how old you were. Ready? Michael rode the boat ashore, alleluia. Michael rode the boat ashore, alleluia. Now, beginning in the 1950s, the song Michael Row the Boat Ashore became popular through the American folk music revival, thanks in part to the efforts of singers such as Pete Seeger. But Michael Row the Boat Ashore maintained its popularity because it was integrated into a variety of settings. Some of you may have learned the song at summer camp or on the children's television show Sesame Street. Well, others of you may have learned it in a worship service, or perhaps you heard it as background music in a documentary. The Library of Congress has materials related to each of these contexts. And regardless when and where you learned it, even if that time and place is right now at your computer, we're going to learn strategies by which you and the young scholars you advise can begin to assess a musical situation, to describe the music and the musicians, and contextualize musical setting, all using musically appropriate terminology. But here's the best part, and Lynn, don't worry, you don't even need to be able to read music. And quite frankly, you don't need to be able to carry a tune. We're gonna start with a two-part premise, which aligns music with this year's National History Day theme, communication in history, the key to understanding. Within this two-part premise, we posit First, that music is a form of communication. And second, that music functions much like the kinds of resources we use in our historical research. How so? Well, when we conduct historical research, we typically want to find the answers to two types of questions, quantitative and qualitative. And quantitative questions address the who, the what, the when, and the where, and the qualitative questions address the how and the why. And music, regardless of its format or mode of transmission, can be used to answer questions about certain people doing certain things at a particular time and in a particular location. But music can also function as a form of communication among people who have never met, for new and different reasons across generations and in locations far from where a tune originated. Even if we're not musically trained historians, we can rely on the detective skills we hone as historians to assemble the clues. Now, spoiler alert, I purposely chose Michael Row the Boat Ashore. Why? Because it serves as a perfect example of how one song can have a multifaceted history. Now, a few moments ago, we engaged in what is called unguided listening, whereby I hummed and you listened. I then sang and you listened. As we know, we engage in unguided listening all the time, usually in the car or in the shower, when we let the music just wash over us, when we feel the music that we love. And unguided listening is helpful in recalling memories and meanings from the past, especially as they relate to us and to our personal context for those memories and meanings. But let's take it to the next level. Let's revisit Michael Row the Boat Ashore through a guided listening exercise. 
We'll start with the four main quantitative questions and then begin to nuance those questions for our musical investigation. Collectively, these questions will create the basis of our sound profile. And you will be able to create sound profiles for every song or piece of music you encounter going forward. By engaging in guided listening and creating a sound profile, we will be able to assess a musical situation describe the music and the musicians, and contextualize the musical setting without ever having to resort to comments that are usually subject to personal discretion, such as, oh, what a pretty song, or I like the way that sounds. You and your young scholars really are perfectly positioned to adapt your love of historical research to the medium of music. The questions you'll need have appeared on the screen and they can also be found in the materials sent out earlier. Let's begin. As you listen, I want you to be thinking of what is happening right here, right now. Ready? Michael rode the boat ashore, alleluia. Michael rode the boat ashore, alleluia. Okay, you know what has just taken place. But we're gonna start with the who. The big question is who is communicating musically? And the broad question that I want you to bring to every situation is, can you in fact identify the musician? Is that musician audible? Is that musician visible or both? You'll also wanna take into account the quantity of musicians, the gender of musicians, and do you know the name of the musicians or the group in which they're performing? And also take into account who is in the audience. And once you get past the who stage, we can go on to the what. We're gonna start with the sound of the, of the voice. What is this musician doing? Are they whistling? Are they humming? Are they singing? And when you understand that they are singing, be mindful, are they singing with syllables? La, 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 or actual words. And once you get to an understanding of what's happening in the voice, the questions then become, is the musician making any noise or doing anything besides singing, such as clapping, stomping a foot, patting their thigh. I just lifted my leg up, but you can't see my thigh. Tapping a rhythm or playing an instrument. Then, once you know what the result of the musician's performance is, we're going to start thinking about, okay, this is, this is a song, right? We know it's a song, and the next couple of questions are straightforward, but we want to be thinking going forward about the language of the song. Could you actually make out the words? Did you understand the meanings of the word? Are there any unique characteristics? And finally, was there any movement of any kind? Now, once you get past the who and the what, then you can go on to the when and the where. When is this musician's performance taking place? And where is the musician? Where are you? And where's the rest of the audience? These questions yield quantitative information that can help you situate what you heard in the context in which you heard it. And your answers will reveal that you listen to a specific person, me, doing something specific, singing Michael Rowe the Boat Ashore, in a very specific vertical slice of time, just a moment ago, in a specific space in this webinar. Note that the four main questions function in musical research just like they do in historical research, but we've also seen how they can be nuanced for a musical investigation. As you engage in guided listening and create more in-depth sound profiles, you and your young scholars may become intrigued by one of the answers and wish to probe further. Or you may find that you need to conduct additional research in order to answer one of the questions more fully. That's fine too. Let your detective skills guide you as you formulate more questions. Let's try another guided listening exercise. This time, we'll consider a song with which each of us probably has personal experience. Happy birthday. Now the function of happy birthday 
never really changes. That is the why we sing it remains the same. We sing happy birthday to celebrate a birthday. Let's create a quick sound profile of me singing happy birthday. But in order to spice things up a bit, I want you to pay it very careful attention to the way I communicate using more than my voice. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, National History Day. Happy birthday to you. Now, your answers to the questions who, when, and where are definitely going to resemble those from our profile of Michael Rowe, the boat ashore. I'm still the musician, just me. We're still in this webinar, just a few minutes after our singing of Michael Rowe, the boat ashore, and we're probably all still sitting at our computer. But this time, the what is different. My musical performance of Happy Birthday has moved beyond the realm of the sound to include a visual component. I use my hands to communicate the rhythm, that is, happy birthday to you, the speed of the rhythm, that is, the tempo, and the fact that it slowed down, and a cue for you all to join in, and to stop singing at the same time. Now, by learning to assess the visual components of musical performances, you're actually preparing yourself to assess live performances and those on video. Now we'll listen to a field recording of Happy Birthday that was made in 1977 in a worship service at a Pentecostal church service in Chicago. This recording is held in the American Folklife Center. To facilitate the creation of our sound profile, I'll highlight some of the areas of distinction that might be most notable, noticeable. But because you already know the when and the where the performance took place, I'll fill those in too. As we listen, let's focus on the who and the what. One quick note, please turn the volume on your computer all the way up. Now take a moment to consider the differences between my performance of Happy Birthday and this one, just as you remember them taking place. Let's play it again. Now, in my case as a performer, it was only me. <laughs> there were no instruments, no additional singers, just me. And these were the lyrics, that is, the words of the song that I sang. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear National History Day. Happy birthday to you. Now, I'm sure you noticed that whereas lines one, two, and four were precisely the same in both performances, the lines of the lyrics of line three were changed. But reminding ourselves that uh, of the where that is the performance of Happy Birthday in 1977 took place in the context of a worship service at a Pentecostal church, we begin to understand the difference in the words. If we had witnessed this performance personally, we would have learned there why the lyrics of line three were changed. But sometimes in our musical research, it's not possible to be an eyewitness or an ear witness, and we must rely on recordings. Fortunately, the field recordings, that is recordings made on location and not in a studio, are often accompanied by what are called field notes. Now, these field notes aren't musical notes that you have to read on a staff, rather, 
These notes contain information, often written by an actual eyewitness or ear witness, that will help you create your sound profile and understand the artistic and aesthetic choices made by the performers. In this case, we see in the notes that the birthdays of two children are being celebrated, which led the performers to use an alternative phrase. And once again, given the religious context of the birthday celebration, it fit the needs of the performers and the celebrants. We also learn uh, from these field notes the name of one of the singers, and we're able to confirm three things. The presence of additional singers, the presence of a singing congregation, and the presence of a guitar. This example illustrates that how one song can be adapted to multiple contexts. And as such, the qualitative question why, like its quantitative counterparts, needs to be nuanced. In both cases, happy birthday was, to, was sung to celebrate a birthday. But as we dig deeper into context, we see that I wanted to use the third line, happy birthday, National History Day. I wanted to celebrate National History Day's 40th birthday. And they wanted to use that third line, employed God bless you, to celebrate the birthdays of two children simultaneously within the worship service. So in sum, happy birthday is a song that can be sung by different people in different celebratory contexts, many years apart, and in different physical spaces. Think about how rich your descriptions of music can be as you engage in guided listening and create sound profiles. Remember, these questions enable you to assess. You can assess historical and contemporary musical situations. You can describe musical sounds and how they are created and performed. And you can contextualize the role of the musicians, the purpose of the music, and the rationale behind the musical performance itself. You can also revisit a particular component of the performance, such as the relevance of my hands, and consider how they complemented or supplemented the musical communication. And with practice, you'll find that sound profiles can be used to help you gain a holistic understanding of much more complicated musical situations. Now, so far, we have witnessed a certain person or certain persons singing a particular song at a particular time and in a particular location. But now we will assess and describe and contextualize music as it communicates through cultural memory among people who have never met, for new and different reasons, across generations, and in locations far from where a tune originated. In contrast to Happy Birthday, not every song has a singular overarching purpose or function. As I mentioned in the spoiler alert, I chose Michael Rowe the Boat Ashore because of its multifaceted history. In its original context, Michael Rowe the Boat Ashore emerged as a work song sung by oarsmen to help them coordinate their strokes and pull their oars in unison. These oarsmen were previously enslaved men who inhabited Port Royal Island, which is one of the sea islands along the coasts of South Carolina and Georgia. After their emancipation in 1861, these oarsmen were responsible for rowing boats between the island's port of Beaufort, South Carolina and nearby ports. And every trip back and forth was made much more difficult by weather, rough waters, and the extra weight of the passengers. And as such, Michael Rowe the Boat Ashore has numerous verses, most likely to help pass the time, but also to tell stories, many of which have biblical roots. Let's get our geographical bearings by taking a look at a map from the antebellum period. This map is rendered with type. That is, it's not handwritten, which may make it easier for you and your young scholars to consult. And I admit it's a tiny bit difficult to see the original here through the webinar portal. So I took the liberty of making a little call out at the bottom right hand of the corner. The sea islands 
especially Port Royal Island, were of significant interest to abolitionists during the Civil War and in the early phase of the post -bell. These abolitionists usually had ties to Christian churches and they traveled to the islands on what they called educational missions through which they studied the lived experiences of these recently emancipated peoples. I'd like to point out four other locales in the Sea Islands that will actually become very relevant in our forthcoming discussion. First, Hilton Head Island is shown here as Trench Island, also Defusky Island, also St. Simons Island. Now St. Simons Island is in Glynn County, Georgia, and we will also be learning about the next county north called McIntosh County. Michael Rowe, the boat ashore, was first transcribed, that is, written down, by a trio of abolitionists in 1867 in the book Slave Songs of the United States. Let's take a look at some pertinent excerpts from their book. Now, the three abolitionists, William Francis Allen, Charles Pickard Ware, and Lucy McKim Garrison, noted that Michael Row the Boat Ashore was among several songs heard on Port Royal and in nearby locales. And for Michael, they included lyrics to 22 verses that they heard just on Port Royal Island alone, and then another seven verses heard on Hilton Head Island, which was just directly north. But we also learn from the abolitionists that the songs that were sung by these people on, on, in the Sea Islands were, were they served specific purposes. And Michael Row the Boat Ashore was, as you can see here, considered the only pure boat song that Alan Ware and Garrison had encountered. But they note also that many of the other songs that they had heard used for rowing were also used for shouting. Now, their definition of shout is really helpful, especially for 21st century audiences. I'll give you a condensed version, and if you'd like to see the original, it's actually very lengthy, but I just wanted to show you what the original type script looked like. Here's a condensed version. A shout is a ceremony during which community members come together and shuffle around in a ring, sometimes while they sing, sometimes in silence. More frequently, singers stand at the side of the room, singing the body of the song and clapping their hands together or on their knees. Song and dance are extremely energetic and the thud of the feet prevents sleep within a half mile of the praise house, also known as a church. Based on the information available in slave songs, we know answers to several of the nuanced who, what, when, where uh, questions. We know that whereas Michael Row the Boat Ashore was sung for a specific purpose, that is to accompany rowing, many of the other rowing songs were also sung as shouts. The brief description of shouts paints a much broader picture of the music making during this time period and in this locale. But even so, there is no way of knowing precisely what the music sounded like because recorded sound wasn't invented until 1877 and it didn't become commercially available until the 1890s. Let's look at what the compilers say about the difficulties of transcription. Again, the words of the abolitionists who were the compilers will be condensed for you. The difficulty experienced in attaining absolute correctness is greater than might be supposed. And we are far from claiming that we have made no mistakes. The best we can do, however, with paper and types, or even with voices, will convey but a faint shadow of the original. The intonations and delicate variations of even one singer cannot be reproduced on paper. Now, despite the compiler's copious notes, we still don't know what the original singers on the island thought of their songs or their singing or the fact that they were being observed. Thus, without a sound recording, two big questions emerge. First, is it possible 
to build a full sound profile of the original renderings of Michael Row the Boat Ashore, or by extension, the other songs sung on the sea island. And second, if not, is the sound profile still relevant? And these two questions hint at an issue that music historians deal with all the time when working with music that was created before the advent of recorded sound. But our situation is not unique. Keep in mind, there are no recordings of the music to which George Washington li uh, listened to. There are no recordings of the Star Spangled Banner, the year that it came out. We have no recordings of Frederick Douglass on the violin. Fortunately, even an incomplete sound profile, that is, one created without hearing the original music, has the potential to lead us to something even more valuable. In situations like these, I like to stop, step back, and take stock of what I know. And I want to use it as a frame of reference in my research going forward. Now, so far, we've considered the eyewitness and earwitness accounts of our song, Michael Row the Boat Ashore, from the 1860s. And we've considered its presence in a variety of venues following the American folk music revival. But in the next exercise, we'll investigate the music in vogue on the sea islands in the 1860s through the lens of an oral history and through cultural memory. Together, we are gonna skim through the contents of two library collections and keep our eyes peeled for anything that may be able to help us. Now, you and I both know that when we conduct historical research, <laughs> we often don't even know what we're looking for. And the same holds true here. But remember what you do know. You do know who was singing. You do know who was transcribing. You do know what was being sung, and you know its function. We also know from our research we know generally when and where the song was used, when the compilers visited the islands, and where the sea islands are. Where do we go from here? You know, for starters, you and your young scholars could actually conduct a search on the library's catalog using a combination of keywords. Now, this can be a great technique for casting a really wide net. To demonstrate this tonight, I want to compare the findings of two combinations of keywords, both of which combine the what with the where. In the first example, I used music and sea islands as my keywords, and in the second, I used song and sea islands as my keywords. Of course, you can also add parameters to your search, to your heart's content, and to narrow your terms. We know, for example, we could use the name of a specific island uh, in place of just the general sea islands in our search. And there are many other substitutions you could try. Let's examine the first three things that are retrieved in these two keyword searches. Now, as with all searches, it's good to remember that sometimes a computer pulls up items that simply aren't relevant, as is the case here. So now we'll actually focus on the two archival collections that were pulled up on both searches. Like the field notes that accompanied the happy birthday performance, a different type of notes is used to provide an overview to the archival collections, that is, to the scope of its contents. These scope notes, in addition to the metadata, which contains a lot of technical information about the recording, will offer clues that can lead us to the music. Our detective skills will come into play, and we must stay on alert. The metadata and notes for the first collection, the A.H. Stoddard Collection of Gullah Recordings, reveals that these recordings are of Albert Henry Stoddard, who is recounting stories about animals in a dialect known as Sea Islands Creole, which is also called the Gullah Geechee dialect. Now, I will come back to the term Gullah Geechee shortly. Although these are sound recordings, they are in fact non-musical recordings. Keep that in mind. And we also know more a little bit about when and where. We know that Stoddard is originally from Defusky Island, South Carolina, which is just south of Hilton Head. And we know that he recorded the tales at the Library of Congress on June the 23rd, 1949. 
In the second collection, the information about the Lomax, Hurston, and Barnacle collection reveals that this trio of researchers interviewed people on St. Simons Island, Georgia, and in Florida and the Bahamas during a 1935 trip. And we see that some of their recordings are now part of a collection titled Voices Remembering Slavery, Freed People Tell Their Stories. For our purposes, the recordings on one of the sea islands, St. Simons Island, Georgia, may be of interest. And by extension, we see that some of the interviewees are speaking in a dialect, which is listed here as Gullah and Sea Islands Creole. Now, it may be useful to remind your young scholars that even though we don't have access to sound recordings made during the era of slavery, recordings such as those made by formerly enslaved peoples may help us to get a better sense of what the music of the time sounded like. The first item under Voices Remembering Slavery happens to be an interview with a man from the Sea Islands, from St. Simons, Georgia. This is an interview with Wallace Quarterman, who was born in 1844. Over the course of the interview, he describes the day he was emancipated, and he sings the song, I Surrender. Given the nature of the recording, it may be challenging to hear all of Quarterman's musical nuances but I wanted you to have the opportunity to hear this historic recording yourselves. Do note that the interviews in Voices Remembering Slavery have been transcribed and a transcript is available for reading and research purposes. Let's listen to Quarterman singing. Yeah, let me come in, oh, let me come in. I said, yes, open the door, and let me come in. I said, baby, don't you cry, mother and father, I'm going to die. I said, Linda, 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 oh, let me come in. I said, Linda, open the door, and let me come in. As you work with your young scholars on this type of field recording, don't be afraid to listen to it multiple times. And remember to take stock of all the resources you have at your disposal. Remember, you have, you've seen the notes about the Lomax, Hurston, and Barnacle collection. There are additional notes about Quarterman's recording, and you have a transcript of his interview and the song lyrics. And in addition, this collection also has images which are available online. Here's an image of Wallace Quarterman. Okay, let's take a pause and let's recap. If we were to create a sound profile of Michael Rowe the Boat Ashore, we have at our disposal a number of things. We have historical resources, including a transcription and description of the song and its function. We have an oral history and singing of Wallace Quarterman, who was born in 1844, was enslaved and lived on the Sea Islands at the time in which we're interested. We have knowledge of more recent uses of the song, and we have access to plenty of documentation about these uses. We also have additional keywords and terms we can use to further our investigation and keep on hand for cross-referencing with the materials at our disposal. For example, you and your young scholars may wish to use Defusky, South Carolina or St. Simons Island, Georgia as geographical terms in a more targeted search. You may also wish to explore more about the term Gullah Geechee and you may wish to learn more about the shout. There are numerous options here, but what might be a viable path forward suitable for young scholars? Fortunately, the Library of Congress has published 729 research guides on different topics for which the library holds materials. Now these research guides can be consulted by you and your scholars as you find a topic for National History Day, explore topics and narrow your focus, and they can be used to find useful materials at the library to facilitate the research process. Personally, 
I have found these guides to be invaluable because they offer overviews, definitions, historical background, and links to more resources. I'd like to show you bits and pieces of different guides and a list of the relevant URLs can be found in your packet, so don't feel like you need to write it down. Let's let it soak in. Now, Gola Geechee is among the topics for which multiple research guides have been made, as different divisions in the Library of Congress specialize in different kinds of materials. Here is a landing page for the History and Culture Guide. This guide gives us a good, solid definition of Gola Geechee people which may help your young scholars to determine whether or to what extent the terms Gola and Gola Geechee could be employed in their research process. Quote, the Gola Geechee people of today are descendants of enslaved Africans from tribal groups of West and Central Africa, forced to work on the plantations of coastal North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. Note also that this guide has several parts including an entire page dedicated to digital collections, which may be of use to your students, especially if you are teaching virtually or through a hybrid model this year. Now on the digital collections page, you'll find links to a variety of types of resources, including first person accounts, images, maps, sound recordings, and guides to the Gullah Geechee people in different states. Let's take a closer look at these sound recordings. The list of sound recordings is selected, meaning what you see is merely the tip of the iceberg. But by glancing at the information on these recordings, I'd like to call your attention to some important features that may very well be useful as we revisit the context of Michael Rowe, the Boat Ashore. Using only the songs here, we could, as researchers, use them to learn more about songs related to boats and water. Songs sung in the Sea Islands Creole and the Gullah dialect, and songs that are known as ring shouts. And to ensure that you're finding everything you can, be sure to look at multiple research guides when they exist from the library's different division. You may detect some overlap, between and among the guides, but it's really best to be as comprehensive as you can when you're gathering your materials. Now, the American Folklife Center's research guides are particularly useful because they show showcase sound recording and audiovisual material. Scholars of all ages find the highlights from the collection to be a real treasure trove. I'm sure you're not su surprised to find that the Voices Remembering Slavery collection is one of our collection's highlights. Recall that Wallace Waterman, Quarterman was interviewed by three researchers, one of whom, Alan Lomax, was on the staff at what is now the American Folklife Center. Lomax also played a central role in documenting traditional music by staging and recording performances at the library. His recordings form a major part of the center's collections today, and the Folklife Concerts, now known as the Homegrown Concert Series, which is featured down here below, is an outgrowth of his efforts. Let's have a listen to the McIntosh County Shouters, who perform ring shouts from Georgia. As you watch them, pay special attention to who all is performing and what all is happening. At the time of this performance, which was 2010, the oldest shouter was 95 years old, and she was accompanied on stage by her grandson. Many of the songs featured on this concert are in fact shouts, and they were performed in much the same way as was described by Alan 
where Garrison, the abolitionist compilers of slave songs of the United States. That is, some of the performers move about in a ring, while others sing and clap from the sidelines. And the beat, that so-called thud that was known to keep the neighbors awake, it's present here too. The McIntosh County, Georgia, it lies south of Savannah, Georgia, and is near the southern end of the Sea Islands, which we saw near St. Simon's Island. Its shouters have now been performing ring shouts publicly for over 40 years. In fact, it was right around 1980 that the members of the shouters learned they were the only group remaining to have kept the tradition alive, as the practice of shouting had been passed down by their ancestors from one generation to the next. Let's hear more about what exactly a shout is. When you hear the word shout, you automatically think vocal exclamation, but it actually refers to the dance-like movement of its participants. When the song hits its stride, and when they feel the, the sound creeping up their spine en route to their soul, the shouters, who are the women dressed in head rags of their grandmother's day, begin to move counterclockwise in a ring. Again, we're using the word shout. Some people say we're dancing. However, religious rules against dancing prevent the shouters from raising their feet high off the floor or from crossing one foot over the other. They move in a shuffling fashion characteristic of a holy dance. They often stoop over and move their arms to pantomime the song in a fashion reminiscent of African custom. At the time of this video, the cultural memory of the shout and the music of the Sea Islands had been kept alive for 143 years since the shouts were first transcribed and described in slave song. The shouters are still performing today. But remember, the ring shout had been practiced long before its music was ever transcribed or described by outsiders. And now that we have a better idea of what a shout is, let's hear more about Gullah. Then we'll view a performance of one shout titled Move Daniel. In the speaker's introduction, you'll hear the phrase teefing the meat, which is Gullah for stealing the meat, as, it's mo as it most likely derives from the word family, thief, thieving, or thievery. When the slaves came from Africa, they spoke in their native tongue. This language combined with English produced a dialect. Many people on the coast of Georgia and in the low country of South Carolina still speak in this di dialect. This thick southern dialect is better known as Gullah. When the shouters perform, much of what you hear can be described as Gullah. If you listen closely, perhaps you'll understand the lyrics of this song. Daniel was a slave. Of all the slaves, Daniel was known to be quick on his feet. The slaves were planning a party and needed some meat for this party. Daniel was given the task of teething the meat for the party. The others, through song, guided Daniel and kept him from getting caught by the massa. Move, Daniel. Move, Daniel, move, Daniel. Daniel.
wonderful, and we can fade out here. Now we've seen and heard shouting as it is passed down from generation to generation. And given the commitment of the McIntosh County Shouters to preserving their musical heritage, we have a much more nuanced understanding of what the music sounded like on the sea islands and how it was performed. On your screen, I'm gonna to present to you here what might be the beginning of a new sound profile that you can finish on your own. We've seen how sound profiles can address individual songs, but they can also be used for genres, that is categories of songs like shouts or boat songs. This kind of sound profile can be used as a way of taking notes on all the materials we've examined this evening. And you can use it in that way going forward too. Remember, sound profiles are a tool and a process. The more you learn from the consultation of individual materials, the more questions you and your young scholars are likely to generate. Think about it. If we had watched the video first, some of you might have asked questions about the significance of the women's slow movement, that slow shuffling movement. Some of you would have picked up on the fact that they were moving in a counterclockwise motion. Others of you would have noticed right away that loud thud of the stick. And still others of you may have said, you know, I can hear some of the words, but I can't, I can't quite pick out all of the words. Why is that? But after having consulted several of these resources in conjunction with one another, we are all much better positioned to assess, describe, and contextualize the performance. But what about our original question on our original song, Michael Rode the Boat Ashore? In truth, we will never know precisely what it sounded like in the 1860s. This evening, we did learn, however, that we can adapt the same questions we use for historical research to the medium of music. And in so doing, we open ourselves up to the opportunity of going far beyond this one song to explore an entire culture of music making extant before the Civil War. And in addition, we've used our library research skills to uncover new resources that helped us to make sense of the ones we already had in our hands. Our efforts have helped us to unlock the rhythms of Michael Row the Boat Ashore and uncover the musical secrets of shouting on the sea islands in the 1860s. I have added a number of additional resources that I would love to share with you. I wanted to present uh, you with some of the major uh, URLs that you can use at the library. I focused those on uh, with an emphasis on teaching and on audiovisual materials. And you'll also see in your packets that I have a glossary of terms. I have lots of uh, information there and I am absolutely more than happy to take any questions you have. All right. Thank you so, so much to Melanie Zek for joining us this evening. I've got some great questions in the queue and please mm -hmm. add some more. Uh, what I just wanna mention, if you wanna get that feedback survey, tinyurl.com slash nhdwebinars. We keep it pretty simple. Take a minute, jot that down, and then let's start with some questions. And I, I should have mentioned this at the beginning because I know we have some students listening in tonight. Uh, Melanie nice. served as a judge at the NHD National Contest. So I've got some judge questions. I've got some musicologist questions. So <laughs> let's ask as many of these as we can. All right, uh, a first question is this is from a student who's working on a project about the 1960s. Uh, this student would like to know, you know, I'm researching the counterculture of the 1960s and sources keep telling me that different source, different people started the 60s. Some sources tell me it's Ken Kesey, some say it's Bob Dylan, some say it's Jimi Hendrix. What kind of suggestions would you give for a student researching this kind of topic and what kind of resources might be helpful for the student at the Library of Congress? 
This is a great question, and I really applaud you for taking a, a, a focus in a particular decade in American history. And you're absolutely right. It is really tricky to kind of tease that apart and figure out who did what, who was responsible for what. Uh, I'd like to actually share with you that uh, one of my colleagues who is in the same position as I, uh, he is both a musicological librarian, uh, he has actually done extensive work on Bob Dylan and has written a book on Bob Dylan. And he got interested in Bob Dylan and then used that as a platform to sort of explore all the materials that we have at the Folklife Center. So if you were to um, introduce yourself to us, what we do is we conduct reference interviews, which is a way we work with um, individuals and, and groups. And we talk with them and we ask them the kinds of questions that you're asking us right, right now. And as much as I would like to give you specific examples of items that I want you to look at tonight, what I like to do is take a little bit more time and get to know precisely the, those nuanced questions, the nuanced who, I heard three different names, the nuanced what, I heard responsibility for the counterculture and, the, and I heard the when. What we can do is work together and find those unique primary resources at, in our archives that may resonate with you and actually help you to discern for yourself how you want to craft and support this argument. It's early in the National History Day season and we certainly welcome working with you. I think you'll find that the materials at the Folklife Center and having musicological librarians at your disposal will be able to instill you in the comfort and confidence you need to make the intellectual decisions you're talking about but also to get those research skills feeling super powerful so that you can continue to research other aspects of the counterculture if one of them ends up not being quite what you thought it was. Does that help? Would that might might that be a, a useful option? That'll definitely help because it's I think it's hard sometimes you start with big questions and they're looking for a single answer. And sometimes we just don't have one. That and the research process has to help uncover the answer. And mm -hmm. oftentimes that historical argument that you think after you've done your initial research that you think you have, the more research you do, the more that you find that it shifts <laughs> and tweaks. Um, here's a question from one of our teachers. How would you answer this question? So how do you view music as a form of communication? How do I? Yes, how do you view music as a form of communication? Kind of think big picture. Ah, I think of music I often find that people use music as a way of commuting, communicating something they might not feel comfortable speaking about in public. A lot of musicians sing about grief. They sing about sorrow. They sing about anger with the government. They sing about distress among certain peoples. And, and there were times in American history, certainly, where you couldn't just get up and have a platform to say what you wanted to say, but in a musical situation, you can get away with communicating those very intense feelings among huge audiences. And I think that would be that I think that would be my answer. Excellent. Well, let me ask you kind of a related question. Mm -hmm. um, another student on here is working on a project on the effect of music on the civil rights movement. Are there some strong ways or some suggestions that you might give this student when researching this topic to help to see not just the music and the songs that were sung or the music that was produced, but the impacts of those songs or albums? Oh, absolutely. We have quite a few resources at the American Folk Life Center specifically on music of the civil rights. I would encourage you off the top of my head tonight, and first of all, I'd be happy to talk with you uh, in more depth, but I would encourage you to look at the music of Fannie Lou Hamer, and I would encourage you to look at the music of Bernice Johnson Reagan. Those are two uh, women musicians who made a huge name for themselves, but also for the practice of using music to communicate notions of peace, uh, communicate notions of distress at a particularly hot time in American history. And because they are women, they are not often included in mainstream writing and talking about uh, the civil rights movement. We often talk about 
the, the male leaders, but those two women were powerful musical leaders. And I think you'll find a lot of really rich information, both reading uh, materials you can read, but I'm confident you'll find um, a lot of sound recordings that you can use to get a sense of what they were singing at various stages in protests and peace gatherings. Excellent. All right, I've got an NHG judge question for you. Ah. So you know from judging that our students create an annotated bibliography and they have to mm -hmm. sort their sources into primary sources and secondary sources. Mm -hmm. Can you explain or give an example when song lyrics or an album might be primary and when it might be secondary? Because this is one of those sources where it's not <laughs> always one or always the other. So can you help us understand when an album or song might be primary and when it might be secondary? Oh, this is a great question. So maybe we could take, um, I just kind of recall what we looked at tonight. The, the musical recording from 1977 um, at the Pentecostal Church, that is a primary source. Why is it a primary source? Because it, is, it, was, it was actually done on location at the church the person who recorded it, I actually know him, he's still living 43 years later after he did this work. He was there live with his little um, tape recorder at the time, uh, listening in. And it's, it's not really a studio recording, so it was just a live sort of right in a vertical slice of time. Now we also think about, um, you ever heard of the Victor Talking Machine Company or also known as Victrola? Sometimes you see the images of a, of a box with a big horn and a, and a little dog waiting for his master's voice. A lot of those historical recordings are rare. They happened a long time ago and we often consider those to be primary resources because they're of historical value. Now, it absolutely gets trickier, Lynn, when we get into more commercialized recordings. So at the American Folklife Center, we focus almost exclusively on things that you would consider primary because they were created on location, they were created on old types of media such as um, uh, the, the, the rolling cylinders like back in the 1890s. So when you have questions like that, we're actually working on um, ways of getting more information out to teachers about this because it's such a tricky question. And I know that the, the sub question of that, of course, is things in the public domain. So we've been working very hard at the library to make these kinds of questions and the uses of these primary or secondary resources to be easier to understand so you can feel better about the decisions you're making. Um, but if you'd like, I'd certainly be happy to talk to you more about that. Absolutely. There's, it's, it's hard, but you know what? This is another great opportunity to engage librarians, whether Absolutely. at the Library of Congress or at your school or at your local, local. library. They are the experts in citations mm -hmm. and bibliographies, and they're really good at either knowing answers or knowing where to find them. <laughs> so I hope that there's some resources in your community that can help you. Okay, here's another interesting question. We've got a student here. Uh, we know that many of our NHD performance students tie into musically related topics. Mm -hmm. And this student is working on a performance about ballads in the Blue Ridge Mountains, how mm -hmm. they were collected, where they mm -hmm. came from, and the stories behind them. Can mm -hmm. you give her any tips or ideas about how to research this story? Oh, this is a great question. I always start with a five-part approach. I try to, in, in, in your case with the Blue Ridge Mountains, you would absolutely find your home at the Library of Congress and the American Folk Life Center. But what I also like what I hear from what Lynn is saying is don't forget to use the statewide archives and some of the more local and focused archives in that region because those folks are collecting from a being right there. They are eyewitnesses and earwitnesses to these histories and they may have sort of that generational uh, knowledge passed down from their ancestors that the Library of Congress has wonderful materials, but we are collecting in many cases, um, we hold these, uh, the, these collections. We weren't actually not necessarily out there collecting. So if you can use both collections or both types of collections in conjunction with one another, 
that's a great place to get your primary resources. I also like to consider, so primary is number one, then I use secondary resources. There is so much about the Blue Ridge Mountains and these ballads that it is really useful to make sure you have a good baseline of what has been written before. Because when you talk about the histories of songs, everybody's got an opinion. Sometimes more than one opinion is actually true. Sometimes they're not true. So I encourage people, let yourself soak in as much knowledge as you can and use, again, the combination of archives, a national repository like Library of Congress and the local more specialized repositories near the Blue Ridge Mountains to get a much more holistic sense of what you're dealing with. That's two. Now, then you have things like reference materials. I can't emphasize this much, enough. When you get to a point in your research that you are seeing the actual documents, which is so exciting to be able to touch and feel and talk about and listen to, be thinking about how they stack up with other collections, with other types of ballads, ballads from different places, ballads from different years. Make sure that you consult books that have done just what you're looking for, and that is lists of ballads, lists of ballad lyrics, lists of when ballads have been recorded. There's so many reference materials like bibliographies, discographies, lyrics books, um, books on titles of songs. Make sure you avail yourselves of those resources because those are the fruits of the labors of people who've done lots and lots of compilation and comparison. Okay, so primary, secondary, and reference. Then, this is where it gets a little tricky, Lynn, right? Because sometimes sonic materials, are they primary? Are they secondary? You know, in cases like this, sometimes I just let them be. I, maybe I just, for the process of the research experience, you really need to get those ballads in your head. At this particular junction, it won't matter if they're primary or secondary quite yet. Be able to sing them or at least clap to them. Get them in your soul. Learn to understand what was going on at the time you're studying. If you merely say, yeah, I know that song, Happy Birthday. It goes like this. Bah, 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 bah. I'm not sure that your understanding is, is lining up. Because Happy Birthday traditionally goes like, Happy Birthday to you. So the same is true here. Be able to internalize that sonic material. Sing it clap it, stomp it, dance to it, know it. Nobody's gonna listen to you. Just learn it and learn to internalize it because the people who created it, I can tell you right now, I know they knew those ballads off the top of your head. That's number four. Number five is when you're, do this fifth part is textual. I like to encourage people when they can, and it's really hard in COVID, that's why I left it so last, is to feel, to experience the Blue Ridge Ballads. What does that mean? Can you go there? Can you talk to someone? And again, Lynn, this is tricky because we, we, you and I have experience with, you know, conducting an interview and, and, and talking to people who know this, but get that information. Somehow, if you can go there, if you can experience it, if you can, um, recreate it. And this is why I say this, because you're also getting ready to do a performance. So again, some of these sort of overlap, right? Primary, secondary, uh, reference, sonic, and experiential. Don't let that freak you out. Just ask yourself, what do I have in these categories? We can work on your bibliography together later. But to get that experiential knowledge as a performer is critical, because you can embody the knowledge that you were trying to convey to your audience, because the people who've been before you, those ballad creators, those ballad compilers, they're actually speaking to you over a long period of time. They've never met you, and you've never met them. You may never meet the people in your audience, but the more you know, the more confident your assertions and your performance will be. And that can't happen if you don't experience what you're working on. Excellent. Okay, I've got two questions. I've got an NHD question and an LOC question. So let me tell oh, wow. you okay. the question first. 
Uh, the question is, if you're doing a performance about music, would it be better to play instruments or to just sing? So let me answer this question because there's the rules of History Day and that contest rule book, and then there's like rules that float around on the internet. And one of these rules is that if you sing in a performance, you're going to win. Now, I got to dispel that because I think the key is it depends on your topic. There are some topics that really lend themselves to singing or to musical instruments, and there's some that don't. So first question I was, I was asked students is, do you need it? Or is it just kind of a way to fill up two minutes? So if you say, okay, and if you're doing a musical topic, well, then it might make sense. Mm -hmm. I think the key is that to make sure that the music is evidence to support your argument, and it's not just performance. And so what that might be is making sure that you set the music up and that you explain or analyze it just like you would any other primary source as opposed to saying, well, here's one song and then here's another song and then here's three and whoa, my 10 minutes just went really quickly. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the key is to make sure that what you choose to do is clear and it creates a setup, a setup of analysis. You can analyze that source and connect it back to your overall historical argument. That's what makes a performance really, really excellent, mm -hmm. is that you make those connections. Okay, let me ask you an LOC question. Okay. Uh, one teacher said that, you know, sometimes her students are, get stuck trying to figure out keywords when they're oh. searching at the Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. What suggestions do you have for students trying to figure out keywords? And if you could explain a little bit how the library's collections are organized, that might be helpful. And would you suggest that they use the Ask the Librarian feature to help guide them in that process? Yes, absolutely. Um, we just started the Ask a Librarian for our center. We started with a new platform, uh, October the 1st, actually. Um, and it's wonderful because your students can write in and ask questions and get some guidance. But Boy, do I understand, because I'm also a librarian, and I know how hard it is for the keywords, which is why I made sure we just took a couple minutes on that today. The reason why people have problems with keywords is because they often confuse them with subject terms. They use them interchangeably. Now, the Library of Congress has its own subject headings, which means it's a standard way of describing something. Keywords are not as standard. We often come to the table with keywords and end up casting a wide net and seeing what we can do. Personally, I think that using keywords in different combinations can be very useful, but I always encourage students to write them down on a piece of paper and to organize them in much the same way, in much the same way we did tonight. If I have the word music, well, technically that's a great word, <laughs> but what about song? So I realized that music and song are in the same category. It's possible, as you saw, sometimes song will pull up something different. And in, in both cases, the top three thing, they were not the same. Only two of the three things pulled up from those keywords were the same. And those are generic terms. Song and music are pretty uh, interchangeable. You can actually take the sound profile, the same questions, and start identifying what keywords might work from a greater than, less than perspective. So if you have music, that's huge. Well, are you looking for a song? Are you looking for a sonata? Are you looking for a symphony? Like, there are so many different ways to nuance that, and you can start out broad. I think it's worthwhile to pay attention when you open up when you click on a particular catalog record, look at the keywords and subject headings that are used in that catalog record and take a moment to explore them. What do they yield? What are they missing? Because if we were to sit here and talk about the theories of keywords, we would all go back to library school. And that is really complicated, but this is a very important part of the research process. I encourage people to build in time into the research process to get used to how the keywords work. So again, these are less standardized ways of accessing materials. And it's possible they may not work, right? So 
when you have a question, you take your generic term, you consider synonyms, you consider narrower terms, you consider broader terms. So right now, where am I? I am basically in the DC area. Where am I really? I'm actually in Maryland. Well, actually Maryland is in the United States. Well, actually that's in North America. So that's just a simple example of how to broaden the where. Be mindful of that because something might actually be more useful than me saying DC area. Actually, Maryland is more specific, right? I'm in, I'm, I'm in a particular place in Maryland. I'm on a particular uh, side of the city in which I'm in. So be mindful of that, but allow yourself the opportunity to explore, allow yourself a chance to open up each and every catalog item you fill that, uh, that you look into. But as you start filling out a chart of your greater than, less than, you'll start to see patterns. And when those patterns emerge, that's when you can be fairly rest assured that you've got a good focus. Now, I will say that the research guides that the Library of Congress has in just this, the count of 729 research guides was current as of the first week of October. Those guides are outstanding. I think they're wonderful for browsing. See, if we were able to get into the stacks, remember the old days when we could go to the library and browse? That's how you learn how to, I learned to use a library with my finger, going up and down and browsing the shelves. We can't do that now because of COVID. So I'm offering a different sort of paper and intellectual way of approaching this, but by all means, I'm happy to help you narrow your search because when you come to a research project with energy and excitement, and I come to your research project with an idea of what we hold, together we will find the right path. In, in the end, you and your, your scholars are stronger for it because they've engaged fully in the research process. Excellent. Well, I'm going to pause things at that point. I want to say a huge thank you to Melanie <laughs> Zeck and the Library Con of Congress's American Folklife Center for giving you the time to join us and thank you for all the time and energy you put into the presentation. I'll remind anybody who's still hanging on, if you go to tinyurl.com slash NHD webinars, make sure you get the S on the end of it, you can give us the feedback. It'll also automatically email you a copy of that response so you can turn it into your principal or turn it into your teacher. All right, thank you so much for joining us. For all of our teachers out there, thank you for all the amazing things you are doing with your NHD students this year. And students, keep researching. We can't <laughs> wait to see your work this spring.